In his commentary on Colossians 3, Matthew Poole discusses the virtues that Christians are urged to adopt as part of their spiritual transformation. Poole begins by emphasizing the contrast between the vices of the old man that need to be discarded and the virtues and graces of the new man that must be adopted. The verse accentuates that these virtues are particularly important for the elect of God, those chosen by God for a special purpose. The elect are not only chosen, but are also sanctified and loved in a unique manner. The virtues outlined include bowels of mercies, which Poole interprets as a deep, heartfelt compassion for the suffering of others. This is not a superficial or cursory empathy, but a deeply ingrained tenderness that compels one to alleviate the sufferings of others. The second virtue, kindness, involves acts of courtesy and benevolence. It goes beyond simply being polite. It extends to actively helping and supporting others in their needs. Humbleness of mind refers to a genuine sense of humility, not something that is feigned or put on as a show. Meekness refers to a disposition of gentleness and mildness in interacting with others, accepting them wholeheartedly. Finally, long-suffering encapsulates the quality of enduring suffering and wrongs with patience and without anger. In summary, Poole affirms that these virtues are not optional, but integral to the Christian life, especially for those who consider themselves the elect of God. Each virtue is not just an individual attribute, but a communal call to action, meant to improve not only oneself, but also the wider community. Also, Poole asserts the Christian virtues of forbearance and forgiveness. Poole interprets forbearing one another as showing clemency and understanding towards each other, especially during conflicts or misunderstandings. He references multiple scriptures to illustrate the significance of this quality, highlighting that it involves refraining from taking advantage of others' weaknesses or inflaming their passions. When it comes to forgiveness, Poole draws attention to the original Greek phrasing, which implies that forgiving others is tantamount to forgiving oneself. He argues that those who understand their own need for forgiveness are more inclined to forgive others. Moreover, Poole justifies the act of forgiveness by citing the example set by Christ. Christ's forgiveness of human sins sets a standard for believers, urging them to do likewise in their interpersonal relationships. Poole indicates the importance of emulating Christ not just in big moral questions, but also in smaller matters that affect communal well-being. In sum, Poole suggests that true Christian living involves a generous spirit of forbearance and a commitment to forgiving others, just as Christ has forgiven us. These virtues are not just moral imperatives, but also deeply interconnected with self-awareness and personal spiritual growth. Furthermore, Poole maintains the importance of charity or love as the supreme virtue in Christian life. Poole contends that charity is not just another grace but the one that binds all other graces together. It serves as the livery of Christ's disciples, distinguishing them as followers of Jesus Christ. Charity motivates sincerity and other virtues, linking them together, and fulfilling the whole law in a manner, referencing Romans 13, 8, 9, Galatians 5, 14, and Matthew 22, 39, 40. Poole refutes the idea that one can achieve justification through charity alone, stating that even the most loving person is not free from imperfections. He debates that charity, although it helps fulfill the law in some way, does not serve as a means for justification, particularly for past breaches of God's law. In addition, Poole interprets the bond of perfectness in two dimensions. Firstly, charity works to integrate the individual graces within a believer, making the person complete or perfect in terms of integrity, even if not in absolute maturity. Secondly, charity serves as the glue that unites the church community, fostering unity and integrity among its members. He refers to Ephesians 4.16, suggesting that charity works to build the body of Christ by tying the members to one another and to the head, Christ himself. Poole concludes by stating that a reciprocal love between God and his followers is the ultimate expression of charity. This love unifies the community of believers in walking according to God's commandments, thereby becoming one soul in Christ. Further, Poole delves deeply into the meaning and significance of the peace of God, as mentioned in the biblical text. According to Poole, the peace being referred to is not worldly peace but a divine kind, made possible through Christ. Christ is seen as the mediator who has made peace possible between God and human beings, as well as among individuals in a community. The phrase, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, carries significant weight. 
The Greek term for rule is unique to this epistle and can mean either to arbitrate or mediate. Most interpretations understand it as arbitrate, pointing out that this peace should govern or oversee all other affections and emotions in a person. It should act as a mistress and governess, moderating behavior and maintaining harmony in the community. Besides, Poole mentions an alternative interpretation, suggesting that the Apostle Paul may have been subtly countering false teachings about the mediation of angels. In this interpretation, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, would mean that this divine peace should take precedence over any other supposed spiritual mediators or intercessors. Additionally, Poole notes the importance of being called in one body, reiterating the unity among believers under Christ. This unity and common calling reinforce the necessity for the peace of God to rule in individual hearts, ensuring community cohesion and mutual edification. Also, Poole advises to be ye thankful, interpreting it as an active encouragement to express gratitude towards God, Christ, and fellow believers. This gratefulness is not just an emotional state but should be reflected in one's conduct, essentially becoming a practical outworking of the inner peace that God provides. In summary, Matthew Poole's exposition offers a multifaceted understanding of Colossians 3.15. It repeats the transcendental nature of the peace of God, its governing role in the believer's life, and the communal unity it is designed to foster. It also hints at its sufficiency over any other spiritual intermediaries and concludes with a call for active thankfulness in life. Moreover, Poole examines deeply into the Apostle Paul's instruction for Christians to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Poole elaborates that this isn't a superficial acquaintance but a deep internalized understanding that comes from faith. Without faith, the word may enter the mind but won't establish a lasting presence in one's heart. This idea is important for all Christians contradicting the notion that only clergy should have an in-depth understanding of the scriptures. Furthermore, Poole expounds on the forms of spiritual expression that Paul mentions, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He disputes that these aren't distinct categories, but can be used interchangeably and collectively for the worship of God. Poole dismisses strict distinctions between these forms and underlines that their ultimate purpose is the worship and praise of God. They should emanate not just from musical harmony but from grace in your hearts, underscoring the necessity of genuine faith and grace in the act of worship. This worship is aimed not at self-edification but at honoring God. Poole urges Christians to be proactive in understanding and internalizing the Word of God and to express their faith and gratitude through various forms of song and hymn. In addition, he emphasizes that these activities should be deeply ingrained in faith and grace to be genuinely pleasing to God. Last but not least, Poole explores into the Apostle Paul's directive for Christians to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Poole elaborates on how this applies universally, both internally and externally, in thought, word, and deed. Paul's directive means that Christians should seek to align all aspects of their life with the teachings and example of Jesus Christ. This isn't merely about invoking Christ's name, but about a comprehensive approach to living. Everything from the thoughts of the heart to the actions of the hand should be guided by and aim to glorify Jesus Christ. According to Poole, the expression, in the name of the Lord Jesus, implies various things. Christians are to seek Christ's authority and follow his example in their undertakings. They should desire strength from him, live by faith in him, and wait upon him for guidance and provision. The worship and service offered to God should adhere to Christ's prescription. All of these things are aimed at bringing glory and honor to Jesus, as the ultimate goal of a Christian life is to be accepted by God, which Poole accentuates is only possible through Jesus. Further, Poole draws attention to the act of giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, clarifying that this thanksgiving is offered to God the Father through Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Poole thus explicates the manifold layers of what it means to do things in the name of the Lord Jesus, articulating that it is a holistic way of living, grounded in faith, aimed at glorification of God, and mediated by Christ. In conclusion, Poole offers a comprehensive and nuanced interpretation of Christian virtues and spiritual life. Poole begins by affirming the virtues such as bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering urging Christians to internalize these traits as part of their spiritual transformation. Particularly, he stresses that these virtues are not optional, especially for the elect of God. 
but are fundamental attributes that should reflect in actions beneficial to the community. Besides, Poole asserts forbearance and forgiveness, citing Christ's example to stress the importance of these virtues. According to him, a generous spirit of forbearance and a commitment to forgiving others are critical for personal spiritual growth. He further argues that those who understand their own need for forgiveness are more inclined to forgive others, reinforcing the reciprocal nature of these virtues. Also, on the subject of charity or love, Poole deems it as the supreme virtue that ties all other virtues together. While refuting the idea that charity alone can lead to justification, he highlights its role in unifying individual graces within a person and the church community. Charity, according to Poole, is the ultimate expression of love between God and his followers. Moreover, Poole investigates the meaning of the peace of God, differentiating it from worldly peace. He interprets it as a divine peace made possible through Christ that should govern human emotions and foster community unity. Furthermore, he notes its sufficiency over any other spiritual intermediaries and ends with a call for active thankfulness in life. In addition, he expands on the Apostle Paul's instruction for Christians to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and explains its importance for all believers, not just the clergy. He encourages various forms of spiritual expression, indicating their ultimate goal is to honor God. Finally, Poole interprets Paul's directive for Christians to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus as a holistic approach to living. This entails aligning all thoughts, words, and deeds with Christ's teachings for the glorification of God. He elucidates that any form of worship or service should be offered to God the Father through Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man. In summary, Poole's commentary serves as an extensive guide on how to live a virtuous Christian life, with emphasis on community, self-awareness, and spiritual growth.